I hear you, Jim. I just had to turn up my volume. Okay. And you, have you blocked our um, our videos as well? Videos live. Welcome everyone to Community Services Committee July 14th meeting. Um, we are on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people and we share a recent history that I as a descendant of a settler am not proud of and I don't think most settlers are. Um, and I just like to say that I think we need to really pay attention as we move forward um, to keep in mind that reconciliation is going to require an approach based on humility, based on honesty, and based on respect. And my hearts go out to the Indigenous people in our valley and around the province and around Canada at the moment in particular. Um, so first thing up, approval, of, well, first thing up is to welcome Brian Harrison. Thank you for coming. And we have an approval of the agenda. Any objections to approving the agenda as it is? No. Nope. So the agenda is approved. Um, adoption of the minutes. Has everyone read the minutes and okay with them? Any objections? Okay, minutes are adopted. Uh, Ms. Legault, do we have any business arising from the minutes? No, we don't, Madam Chair. Uh, public input period. No requests to participate in public input period either. Thank you. Okay, great. Moving right along, we've got mostly an agenda that's about. Madam Chair, could I interrupt, please? Of course. Um, I do understand that there was a. Um, I certainly got um, notification of uh, public input period from uh, Mr. Jim Pelletier on item R6. Did um, legislative, legislative services not get that one? It was addressed to them. Ms. Uh, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. I can distribute that by email to the directors. There was um, it came after the deadline and was not requested to um, participate live. And it's actually about a boat launch issue and not recreation facilities. Yeah, my my um, my my understanding is that uh, that boat launch is part of the recreation facilities, and that's why uh, he sent it out. But, but as long as the um, the directors know that it has been submitted, thank you. Great. So we've got um, mostly transit today. Five items of transit. So Jim, Mr. Wakeham is going to be busy. Uh, so let's move down to R1. This is a decision item. So pay attention. Mr. Wakeham. Thank you, Madam Chair and good afternoon, directors. This particular item is not a transit item. It's uh, more related to the uh, Ingram Street uh, Function 200 budget here and the purpose of the current year's uh, budget amendment is to include two grants that we have been successful in receiving for two separate uh, projects. We've been approved for $60,000 for the HVAC project, which will provide more funds for our project contingency and $42,000 grant for the electric vehicle charge station um, install that we plan to do uh, in a couple months in the CVRB back parking lot. So there is uh, a resolution with two items. Would you like me to read that, Madam Chair? Thank you. That would be recommended to the board that the 2021 budget for function 200, the administration building be amended to one increase provincial grant revenue by $102,000 and two to increase building improvements by $102,000. I've got a mover and a seconder. Any questions? All in favor? That looks pretty unanimous. Any uh, dissenting people? Nope. Okay, R2. Now we do transit. Correct. We've got a few uh, transit uh, reports here. So the first one is regarding the uh, BC Transit uh, customer satisfaction survey that do generally on an annual basis. Um, and this report was done a little differently than past years, which normally they do by telephone and online survey. But this year they did in-person meetings with riders and the public that were at various uh, stop locations. 
And you know, with the different format used, it's a little bit difficult to compare, to do a direct comparison from year to year. But the focus was to really focus on three items. What's the, what's the people's feeling about our customer satisfaction? What trends do we have in transit usage? And three, to identify areas that need improvement. Um, the full survey, which I think is 50 plus pages, is included as attachment A. Um, so I'll, I'll just give you a quick briefing on the three areas here. <clears throat> on the satisfaction side, uh, this is good news. Overall, the impression was positive and we scored better than we did in the 2018-2019 uh, survey at that time. The trends in local service, um, kind of as expected, ridership is down, especially on the commuter, and this is mainly due to the pandemic. Uh, but the local service has steadily increased over the past few months, including our custom service, so that's a good sign. We, see, we received uh, good feedback from many regular riders, and that's also good to get some consistency. And the main three reasons for using the service were 36% for uh, people using the bus to go to work, 31% for people doing various shopping errands, and 11 is a bit of a mixture of social and recreation trips. The key to focus here on the area's improvement, um, number one, and not surprisingly, was the need, or actually I'll say the request, for more survey uh, was expressed. and along with also some infrastructure desire to install more shelters and benches. Then also there was some notes that the trip times of some of the trips don't line up with some of the riders' schedules, and that's, uh, that's kind of understandable as well. The top four areas for additional service that was requested, again, really not surprising, we've been kind of hearing this over and over, was more weekend service, and that was by quite a large uh, margin. And then the next three items, which was service during weekdays, service in evenings and the connection to the RDN were kind of the next three lumped together. So the survey information that we take is, is really helpful and it, it helps us in our planning of infrastructure and our uh, potential next service expansions or improvements. And, and that'll be summarized when we bring that forward in the next um, report in September, which is the, tip, is the annual BC Transit, our three-year transit expansion priority program. So we'll bring that forth to you. And, this, this survey, is it, it's also a bit of a, a stepping stone into the next report, which is about our Transit Future Action Plan. But that's the quick, really, summation of the survey information. Open to any questions if somebody may have them. Thank you, Mr. Wakeham. Director Smith. Thank you. Through the chair to staff, I was just wondering, there didn't seem to be an indication of how many actual passengers traveled uh, between the 8th of March to the 11th of March. The only statistic there is the 122 that were surveyed. Did you happen to have a number for that time frame? Um, Madam Chair, in responding to the question, uh, unfortunately, no. The the report only indicates just the items that were um, the people that were spoken to or interviewed, and and that's a good question. I will ask BC Transit on on that question because I don't know it at this point. Any other I questions? Have, have a follow up. I was just wondering um, that you know this is a great survey, but you almost wonder why they're not walking to the parking lots and doing a survey in the parking lots to say, you know, a little bit more information about maybe people have information as to the satisfaction uh, that they're receiving on uh, the bus service or why they're taking their vehicle. Um, that would give them a truer reflection of the actual satisfaction of the service it would include both sides of of the service why people are not using it and then those that it sounds like these people seem to be regulars on the service may I respond there to that? any thought on that one thank you sure i can Please. respond that's the difference in the survey typically bc transit does online um, surveys to various people, not just not just people taking the, the, the bus. And that's what was done in 2018 slash 19. This was what I just mentioned. This is one done differently. They, they, they wanted to target our riders that we have at this point. So that's why I say it's a little bit different when you're comparing the two sort of uh, results of the surveys. But, you know, fair comment. I make, made a note here and to try and broaden out our approach, which is what we're going to do with the next item, which is a transit future action plan. As we try to plan our next five years, and I'll go into that report in a minute, but that's that will also include public engagement, not just our current ridership. Thank you, Director Sebring. Yeah, that was uh, Director Smith kind of covered what I was going to say, but that was my observation too. 
I mean, this survey was done at the bus stops, obviously with users, and you're going to get a completely different picture uh, because you have people that are somewhat vested in the in the transit system. Uh, I I would uh, posit that it would be probably more accurate to to do a more broadly based survey and find out why people are not using transit. I mean, these are people who are, and and fair enough. But it really does skew the the outcome of the results. So I, I, I have a little less confidence in this one than I do in the the one uh, in 2018-19 because I think that's a more accurate picture of community at large. That's all. Thank you. Any other questions, Director uh, Marsh? Yeah, I, I just I guess if I need to form it into a question. Well, I'm thinking I'm going to say hi, Brian Harrison. I didn't recognize you. <laughs> and um, would you say, Mr. Wakem, that uh, certainly the I would think that since COVID, any survey would be a little bit skewed. And um, would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's a fair comment, and that is the challenge. You're right for sure. Um, right. You know, and and so I just I just received a note here also from Rochelle, who's also on the call, and um, they'll reach out also to non-riders through the Transit Future Action Plan, and that's that again is is keep, is keep that in mind. It's an it's an important uh, it's important and next step as well. So we do get more of a broad base from the community. But no, the points are that have been raised are well taken. Right, and and I think just to end, um, one of the main issues why many of us don't use it, aside from this last two years in COVID. Is it doesn't line up to where we need to be when we need to be there and i think that has to do with numbers and i don't know how to get the numbers to start doing it so we could have have more bu more buses but where i grew up you could walk out the door and in 10 minutes there was a bus right but that's not the way it's going to be here for a long long time because we don't have the population i mean just add a comment madam chair you're right. I was going to ask where, where, uh, where did you grow up? But I won't, won't put you on the spot on that because the population was probably uh, more dense or not spread out. But one of the I, things to keep in I mind. grew up in New Westminster, which oh. is basically you just keep driving and you wind up at the ferry to come over here. So it's a very big place. Right. And the other thing to keep in mind is, as the report is titled, this was a customer satisfaction survey. This was not a broad-based public customer uh, uh, survey as well. I would like to move into R3 because I think a broader discussion would be helpful. So if people could just hold their questions because I think they both, they all go together. So um, hold your, uh, Mr. Wakem, if you could talk about R3. Thank you, Madam Chair. This one's, um, this was really a, an exciting exercise so far and um, we're, we're just into it. So this report provides a summary from the three key areas that we've received consultation with and that's the stakeholder sessions, the transit operators, which is the bus drivers for the most part, and obviously the CBRD board. So I thank you to the directors that did uh, participate in that. It was appreciated. So the information that was collected provides the basis for developing the next step, which we're trying to come up with developing our service priorities that will be included in the public engagement campaign that we'll be doing later in the probably late summer, early fall. And remembering the goal of the Transit Future Plan is to create the, um, the priorities for the infrastructure and the service improvements over the next five or so years. Uh, in the report, there was a high-level summary of the background information that was provided as attachment A. I won't go into that, but you know, I, I think a couple other good valid comments. We had fairly good representation um, of many of the key stakeholders from the various organizations that we had over the two workshop sessions. And without going into all the items, I just thought I'll just list a couple of sort of the popular themes. Um, really, most of them are not too surprising. So the first one is establish this frequent circular route in the core area. And that's been gaining popularity, but it is a challenge again, because it comes back to density. When you try to define the core area, that could be a very short trip. That could be like a 10 minute trip. And how often do you do that? And can you afford to do that all day long? If you're going, as an example, from Village Green Mall, to the current hospital, to uh, VIU or James Street, and then possibly up to Couch and Commons. It would be, you know, you, you see those in places like Seattle where, you know, the density and there's people getting on and getting off in a couple kilometers. So uh, we understand the concept and we're definitely going to look into it again. Second one was there was some consideration by some Duncan residents that thought the main hub should be moved from Village Green Mall to Duncan train station. 
um, and seems like a reasonable suggestion. I'm not sure that's doable. We're going to follow up with the city of Duncan, but I just don't think there's enough space along Canada Ave or even maybe Duncan Street to do that. But I'm just pointing out what some of the uh, some of the feedback we got. There was some discussion that there was a need for servicing middle and high school students that don't have uh, or not eligible, I guess, for school busing. Um, there's always a, a request to have better transit connections and better bike storage locations, which typically would mean lockers at certain locations, which can be quite expensive and there's a risk of vandalism. And then of course, there's always a request, I won't go into it for more service to, to Nanaimo is a hot one, of course, and even the new hospital area was mentioned by some of the North Couch and uh, staff members. From the transit operator's perspective, so we asked their, their supervisors and their bus drivers to give us their comments and uh, how we think we can improve the service. And they provided some good feedbacks, um, suggesting that we should be starting earlier in some areas, better lining to ferries if we can, but we always know that's an ongoing challenge. Um, they made it pretty clear to us that there is really no formal washroom facilities or, or a transit exchange facility anywhere, and they are using informal washroom arrangements, and so they're asking if we can make improvements on that and or even possibly build. Uh, I know some places like uh, Juan de Fuca uh, Capital Regional District has specific washrooms just for, for transit employees. And then they also provided, it's in the package as well, um, as attachment B, they provided a couple of key areas where we might want to focus in with regard to future expansion of service, but some of those are um, a little bit remote or less densely populated, and we still have to evaluate the actual demand going forward on that. With regard to the CVRD board survey findings, um, some interesting data and, and uh, a couple of summations here. 65% felt the CVRD transit is an attractive transportation alternative to the private vehicle, so that's good. 45% felt that transit reduces the community impact on the environment, so that's not bad. And not surprisingly, only 20% felt the transit system is somewhat efficient. So, you know, we're, we're trying to deal with the, the key theme here and the issue is about, is, is the challenge of providing services to all areas, providing coverage, and a lot of it is in low density, and yet, how do you do that economically? Um, the highest ranking priorities that were, there was a question asked on this, and, and they came out as the transit access to people with low incomes, which generally includes some low density areas, but not always, um, environmental sustainability, and cost efficiency. And, and, and so also the investment in the interregional service, which was good to hear, RDN, of course, is a hot topic in Victoria, ranked uh, the highest of our three services that we offer. So between conventional, interregional, or custom, the people, uh, so, sorry, the, the directors ranked um, the, the interregional services very high. Um, one other key sort of summary point I would point out to you, and this is really important to me, is, is that seven, it, when I say important to me, I'm saying this is an important item we're gonna have to really um, continue discussion on because it really leads into what we're gonna do with the system. 72% of respondents supported investing resources on routes with high ridership over lower density or less ridership routes. So this is the key aspect that, you know, we need to delve further because it would likely mean less scheduled route coverage to lower density areas that may not have other affordable transit options. So this is the balance. And for many of you have been here over the years, we've been trying to balance providing service to all regions and, and trying to balance the resources and the dollars in that and, and we know a lot of those routes are not efficient. We are gonna to continue to put more pressure on BC Transit to come up with options like uh, flex routing or um, uh, digital on demand routing, possibly taxi savers. And you know, there's various areas where we can consider this, but this is really a crucial aspect from a philosophical standpoint of the committee is to where do you wanna put your investment? And I'm gonna give you one example here that I think is, is really to the point. The Eagle Heights, area has, when it was developed, the plan was to have uh, a two-way route, one that goes clockwise, one that goes uh, anti-clockwise. And when it got developed, because there had to be cuts in other areas, it got reduced down to only a one-way route. And that is really a poor development design of a route. If you think about the people that are riding that, that bus, if they get on, let's say the first stop, they got to go all the way to the end to get to get back home, if you will. And so there's an example of if you just look at the ridership of that route, it scores pretty low because it's it's sort of a, a broken 
uh, wheel, if you will. So on one side, you'd say, don't put any more investment in it. I would suggest to you, we need to put more investment and we need to give the secondary route and then the ridership will go up. So I'm just using that as an example because there's a few others like that that you need to you know, spend money to, to, to get some results there. So that's kind of my quick summation of the report because there's lots of information. And this is, again, this is the, the first aspect that will lead to um, the, the recommend, not the recommendations, but just some suggestions to when we go out to the public and get their feedback as well. So that's kind of my quick update on that report. Thank you, Mr. Wakeham. Really interesting. So I have uh, Director Wilson. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Wakeham. That's uh, it's an interesting subject, this one, and it's, it's certainly one that, uh, because of the topography and the geography of, um, of of our areas, is very difficult to solve. One of the things that you said there was um, the. I think it was to concentrate on the higher density routes at the expense of the lower density routes. Um, and I can see that as being a good move, but, uh, but it should it, does it necessarily mean that we then have to reduce the lower density? Because as far as I can see, if we concentrate on the higher density, the extra income that we get from those, if we can increase the ridership, would surely subsidize um, the lower density. Is is that a fair summation or, or is that something which is very difficult to achieve? Mr. Well, Wake sorry, thank you. Here's a good example. And you and I have chatted many times about your area because it is one of those challenging areas. So here's an example. <clears throat> if if that route was, if the, if the, if the two um, trips that run through your area are if you just look at the density, it's not just Cobble Hill, but you have to look at sort of the South Couch and excuse me, you have to look at Duncan. If we were to add more trips because that would service more people in the South and more people around Duncan, that means there's going to be more buses going through your area and there might be fewer people on them. So it's a bit of a chicken and an egg. So, you, you know, you and I have chatted quite a bit about yours because you have that situation where you've got some people south of you that want to get on and some people that are they get on and they get off very quickly we know that in the south we have two routes eight and nine we know we have to adjust or fix those routes we we have to it's just not that for the population it's serving it needs to do better but we understand the challenges there's big gaps in time and some of the people in the south don't want to go all the way up to arbutus ridge and then carry back on to duncan because it's taking too long so that's where maybe taxi saver, maybe flex routing, they come into play, but those are kind of buzzwords. But the problem with the flex routing is we don't have spare buses we can just throw on the road. In other words, let's let's eliminate some of the, the scheduled trips and let's just put on a, a, a smaller bus like we do out in Lake Cowichan area um, because we don't have that small bus sitting there. We'd have to go purchase one, but that's it's just a challenge. We can look into those options. Yeah, understood. Um, follow up, please, Madam Chair. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I understand that. And, and I don't think um, I'm not in referring in particular to my area or the south. I'm thinking more in terms of the, the whole areas where there is a, a rural population there, which um, these and I, I do honestly think that, you know, the direct routes that go from, let's say, Mill Bay to, uh, to to Cobble Hill to Duncan are the ones which would be the most ones that we need to concentrate on. But uh, so it's something which obviously is, is going to take a lot of thought to, to work out with the kind of um, areas that we got. But thank you for your response anyway. Director Andy DiNardo. Madam Chair, through you to Mr. Wakeham. My question was, was um, or maybe just my comment more or less, um, speaking of investments, but um, since COVID and probably even before, but it wasn't highlighted as much, is the washroom issue. Um, washroom issue with um, construction workers, truck drivers, bus drivers, all of them. It is something that we do not um, actually... And we all need to use them, but it's something that we don't think about. And I think that that is uh, a high priority investment that would could be utilized and we need to do um, more of um, those. And that was, like I said, highlighted through COVID when the very few washrooms we had in the village of Cowichan Bay were closed. So thank you. Good point. Sure. 
Thank um, you. You know, it's, it, I'm glad we were, I'm glad we surveyed the bus company because those are something that we wouldn't take into account. We don't see that. We generally listen to the riders, not so much our own bus. They're not our bus drivers, but they service us. And so, you know, I, yeah, I looked at that and I went, you're right. Other than using, you know, Valley View or uh, um, uh, the, the Duncan public washroom, uh, there's, there is some, um, they, they've done the, the the first Canada has done some arrangements with some of the landlords, but it's really a bit ad hoc, and they're looking for a little bit something more formalized, so they don't have to worry about it. And it's a fair comment, um, so we do have to look at that as well. And of course, that I'm going to be looking for grant opportunities for those things because to build the washroom is not cheap. Director Toporowski, did you have your hand up? Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Mr. Wakeham. I I looked at um, attachment B and the suggested uh, new service areas, and I, I seen Genoa Bay, but I wasn't sure if you're going all the way to the end. Um, that was part of the suggestion, but I know uh, my concern is the road is very narrow down there, <laughs> so I'm not I'm not sure like. Um, about that that option, but it is it is a nice place to go, um, I must say. But I do really like your idea about the taxi savers, because when um, that fellow came along about the new hospital and he's looking for new ideas and how our community is not going to be able to walk to the hospital from their home or whatever or get there. Um, quicker. <laughs> um, and so people that live in town that don't have cars may be foregoing going to the hospital because the bus isn't available. Um, they don't have enough money to pay for a taxi or, or whatnot. So I know um, maybe the, the head guy at the hospital might be able to help you on those taxi saver things too, because <laughs> they didn't put it put a bug in his ear about it. Um, because we do have a lot of people up, um, you know, like we, we seen in, in the, um, survey or the, the ridership, uh, Provo, which is number two, which is towards the hospital is very high. And so those people are, you know, I've, I, when I was visiting people at the hospital, it was quite a busy stop. <laughs> so I just. I just like the taxi saver idea um, and, you know, you know, we might be able to get the chair to write a letter <laughs> for some support for that. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Smith, oh, would you like to respond? To yeah. Sure. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. You know, remember that, you know, attachment B, some of those areas, these are, um, these still need to be investigated. I, like we know the Bell McKinnon area, the new hospital, of course, that's a, you know, that one and uh, Providence Farm has been asked a few times. And um, so Genoa Bay, we're probably thinking just up to the marina area. We, we haven't done the work to, th this is really a, a high level request coming in. We have to see if the roads are safe enough, how far we can go, how steep they are, is there issues in the wintertime, all that has to be dealt with. With regard to the taxi savers, so this is something that might come out of, every year we, we do the three-year annual um, expansion request and we look at priorities. That's what will be the next uh, uh, initiative coming your way in September to look at. And it, it's an opportunity that we're going to ask BC Transit, rather than just throw hours on buses, what if we throw some funding and I don't know the right amount if we throw some funding as a bit of a seed to use taxi coupons or taxi savers there's pluses and minuses there are some small communities that use them there's challenges that sometimes um, you have to some degree lower standards of transportation but you know we'll, we'll work through all those issues because it's still in the end is transporting somebody from point A to point B so we will um, hopefully be able to bring you a bit of an analysis of what benefit that would be in September as well. Thank you, Director Smith. Uh, thank you. I have had experience with the taxi saver. My mother, who was elderly and had limited vision, I uh, she lived in a rural area, and under the BC Transit, she was able to have eighty dollars worth of um, the taxi savers, and she only paid forty. 
and it really made a difference for her and her lifestyle because she was able to order a taxi have the taxi pick her up right at her door and dro and drop her either at the medical appointment right at the door or at the grocery store and then she was picked up at the grocery store and delivered right to her door at home uh, Handy Dart was just never available and she wasn't able to walk the distance to a bus stop. So the Handy Dart, uh, even with the 50-50 or however it worked, it was definitely uh, a benefit and it saved a Handy Dart that wasn't always available. And um, also I think it has for, especially for seniors, it has a really good um, friendship is created between the taxi drivers and the senior or the other person that's using the taxi savers. Um, they they get a little bit more uh, service. Uh, quite often they would carry my mom's groceries all the way into the house, which was really, really appreciated. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know what she always was buying at the store, but it was definitely really a great service. And I would really think that was really important. One of the things in the um, R2 that I noticed was that there was, um, I think it was something like about a 61% of the ridership was satisfied or very satisfied with the ability, availability of the bus shelters and the benches. And I'm just thinking that as we move through climate change and I wouldn't want to be standing at the side of the road during the heat at this time or during a rain event. So I'm not sure where we're headed in that direction. I think that, you know, our customer may be satisfied on a very nice day, but um, looking at some of the differences that we're having with climate change, that would be something. And I had one more more um, comment was, I was just wondering about the ferry. Are you talking about the uh, ferry from Salt Spring Island? When you're talking about coordinating, you're not talking about it from Penelicut um, area. Is that correct? Madam Chair, Thank can you. I respond? Yeah, so your three items, yes, for most part it's Salt Spring. That's the one that we seem to be um, not connecting well for the most part, but ultimately this could even lead to ferries within the RDN when we get that service connected. Uh, with regard to the taxi savers, so again, I, I think there's a lot of positive to this. I know BC Transit had done some preliminary work to source out um, how many taxi companies are available um, are they willing to do the service? Uh, it's a little bit different because taxis for some degree work on tips as well. And this doesn't really bring in tips to, into the situation, but I'm going to leave that for BC transit to, to update us on the ability of, of taxi service or services. So I think there are some benefit, especially since if you don't, I think you, I, I mentioned to you, we've lost the couch, the seniors community foundation service that has since, uh, uh folded. And so unfortunately that is going to put a little bit more demand on the, um, custom or the handy dart service. So if there's a way that we can get maybe taxis, uh, assisting us because, you know, I, I think the, the cost and you throw it a, a suggested amount and I, I, I would think that a taxi, uh, fare would probably be less than what a one way custom ride costs because they're very expensive. Um, but we'd have to work through that. And, and maybe there's a, a bit of a seed grant program we can put out and say, here's X amount of dollars. Let's see how many people can use it for the purposes that we set it up for. So I think it's, it's good with re your last comment with regard to the shelters and the infrastructure. It's a great comment and it's very valid and, and it's difficult for staff to sort of bring this forward because um, the costs are really, really high. If you are talking a BC transit recommended shelter, which is a metal one, excluding the ground because sometimes you need to be dealing with asphalting and a pullout you're in the forty thousand dollar range so um, we have been lucky enough to tap into bc transit has a bus shelter grant funding project that is generally oversubscribed every year and we try to ask to get in because it pays 80 percent of that cost so rough numbers forty thousand dollars cvrd pays 20 it would cost us about eight thousand ish dollars for one bus shelter um, so what we're trying to do is our transit analyst is trying to put together what would be the, the next half a dozen key areas where we could put in shelters because for the heat benches don't help us much there. Where is the logical, we're going to get the most bang for the buck. 
the targeted area probably is going to be the RDN connector. And I'm going to get to that when we get to that report, but it's, it's the CVRD's responsibility to put in infrastructure for the stops going to the RDN. And if the stops are in the RDN, then they would be responsible for their shelters. But it is something you'll likely see when we bring the 2022 budget forward. There likely will be a supplemental request to see if you're interested in putting some money towards uh, potentially building a couple shelters. And we try to figure out the, the high priority areas. Um, but they are expensive. They're they're not they're not a, a an inexpensive uh, uh, investment. Thank you, Ms. Director Morrison. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in in regards to what I, I think Mr. Wakeham was alluding to earlier about that uh, that critical question of of uh, service hours and and dollars and and you know I I've, I've been here long enough to see that. Uh, you know, communities change, and and we try and tweak here and tweak there, and make make uh, service hour requests. And uh, generally, um, there, there's not a lot of big winners in these in in these requests. And and I just want to share a couple of things in that this is going to be a real tough question that we're going to have to deal with in in the uh, I think fairly near future because the, all of the uh, you know, indicators are is that the province wants to invest heavily in in, uh, in transit. That uh, if we're going to reduce that uh, GHG component of our uh, of our emissions, which is 78 percent in in the Cowichan Valley, uh, you know, those trips in from from the western part of our region are big contributors to that. And uh, you know, I don't want to sort of uh, enhance the ur urban rural divide but uh, essentially uh, the outlying areas have had service cuts hours cuts and and we're we're using different models and and the word that i hear in my community is that it's it's just about ineffective to the point where if there's if there's one more cut then you know people will just abandon it and and use private automobiles so you know, yes, it, it, the the natural tendency is to oh, that's that's got good ridership. Let's invest more money, and we'll get better get better ridership in in some of the uh, more ur urban and heavily used uh, areas. But this transit system was created to be a regional transit system for the whole region, and and I know we don't have all partners in in just yet, but. F and I and, and the town of Lake Couch, we've all you know been there from the beginning and invested heavily. And we used to have really good numbers on uh, the south side of the lake, and and the demographics change and and mills closed and things like that have happened and uh, ridership has gone um, in the wrong direction. And part of that has been because of the cuts and the reduction in, in service and the frequency and all of those sorts of things. So I just raised that as, as an issue because the, the report has said that as elected officials, we're more inclined to not add hours to areas that have low ridership and to focus our resources in areas that have higher ridership. Well, if, if we're going to do that, we might as well you know, essentially realize that people that may be taking buses now are going to start taking a private automobile and that's not going to help on the GHG front. And I raise this because, you know, certain areas are going to be the places where the people that are working on building the hospital and working on building the high school, they're going to be living in the areas that are a little bit more affordable. And, and that's going to mean some of the outlying areas. That's where people are going to be able to afford to live and rent. And if we don't have transit service to those areas, then it's going to be that many more private automobiles on the road and that many more parking issues that we're going to have to deal with. And the GHG numbers are going to go up. So I, I bring that up because, it, you know, I just would suggest, and maybe Mr. Wakeham could comment, um, some areas, if if you really cut much more service out of them, or or don't add to make it a more efficient, more reliable service, uh, we must be at a tipping point. And and do you have any comments on that, Mr. Wakeham? And I'm sure through to Director Morrison, uh, you're you're bang right on. Your point is well taken, and that's why I I, I mentioned it. It it is it is a. Uh, 
a key aspect that the committee is going to have to discuss. And, and I agree with you, the more that the, the more that the ridership goes down and we seem to either not invest dollars in in sort of the low populated areas or to some degree cut their service, which has happened in various, it's making it worse. And, and I use the example of, of uh, Eagle Heights because it's the same. We put in a service that's going one way, almost makes no sense, right? So I can almost guarantee if you put in I wouldn't guarantee, but I would st strongly feel very confident if we put in the uh, the route that goes the other way, you would say your ridership should double, right? It should, right? So I think when staff bring back our recommendations in the fall for the next round of potential uh, expansions, there'll be a mix of that because either we have to do on-demand digital sort of flex routing and or taxi, which is another option in possibly the lake area and or some other in Cobble Hill areas or wherever, we'll look at those. But yeah, I, your point's well taken and I, and I hope uh, the directors, you know, all remember that because it is regional based and and for a lot of people in, even in the low density areas, they don't have a lot of choices for transportation. And so even though some of the ridership numbers are low, they're still key, they're really key to those people. And we've heard that over and over also through from the public. My last comment before I forget back to Director Smith, she asked about the um, the ferries that are affected and the other one I forgot is the Mill Bay Ferry as well. We don't run a lot of trips to that, um, but again, we're trying for the people that do use that service fairly regularly, sometimes our schedule doesn't connect well, which, which all of this leads to, um, as soon as we can get our transit assistant position hired, which allows our transit analyst, Rochelle Rondeau, to look at all those type of more uh, local planning opportunities and starting trips a little bit earlier, a little bit later, it will hopefully uh, allow some improvements to uh, to our roads. I have our Director Marsh and Alternate Director Harrison, and I was wondering, uh, Director Martman, did you want to uh, make some comments? You kind of cut you off last time. Maybe you should go next then. Um, thank you, Chair. And uh, yeah, I'd like to just swing back to, I think it was R2 for a moment, and just have a question for staff around the reliability and validity of this of that survey from your perspective, because I heard, you know, questions around sample size, um, sample representation, and perhaps even though it wasn't mentioned, uh, the timing of it through COVID. So, you know, I know you're, this is part of the part of the big package, but how do you see this in terms of standing up for, you know, information that you can build off of? I know, Chair, through to uh, Director Martin in response, I guess I would look at it this way. Any data is good data. Whenever you can get information and if you can branch it out from the regular type of just over the phone uh, surveys you get, if you can get, you know, your user groups, the people that are using the service now, we think is is actually very valuable. But your point's well taken. Um, you know, it, it's not statistically significant, but it can dig deeper into some of the items that when they when they base comments that we say, yeah, that makes some sense. And, and I don't think a lot of them are far off when we look at, we know that most customers want more service and, and that's that's a take and we know they want to go to the RDN next. We know that that's sort of a, a logical step. And, and we know that, you know, the riders now, they do want more amenities, which is shelters and benches and those things. Those are, those are kind of common. Um, so, you know, I, I would view it as, you know, any data is good, but, but it's not, it's not the end all, the be all. We're not going to base all our, um, recommendations to the committee based on uh, that survey this year. And just to follow up, I guess the one piece that would be very helpful from my perspective is that if you see gaps or limitations to surveys um, that they just be sort of listed. Um, from my perspective, I might miss something. I know others, you know, they all have different points, but I find that useful in, in using a piece of information or data that is collected. Um, so that's sort of the first one. I had a, I had another one on R3, but I can defer to others. Oh, for now. So on R3, and maybe this is just being new um, to staff, but I'm not sure I understand fully the second slide in the attachment A, which is around service span and frequency. Uh, and maybe others, if others are familiar with it, I'll catch up later. But if not, I'd like to try to understand it better and how it's informing you. I can make a general comment, uh, 
so that slide has got a lot of information in it, but what, what I think if you look at the bubbles, it was meant to sort of give you the quick uh, understanding of it. And, and in the bottom right hand corner where you see the red bar shows how early or late service should be running. So you're seeing that on many of our trips that there, there, there needs to be, uh, the service needs to run longer and start earlier is what that's sort of indicating. Um, the gray areas are suggesting we're meeting our targets. The targets are our performance standards and our um, uh, performance, uh, sorry, our, our performance standard guidelines that we have created before. Um, when I look, I'm just looking off of that, that, uh, that document now, in the darker green area, the more frequency in the service, that makes more sense as well. So it really is just to give you a snapshot by the route and the time of the day going across. You can see there's a lot of, of course, service in the middle of the day, but there's a lot of gaps, you can see that. And your point about listing gaps and surveys, that's well taken. I appreciate that. And I'll pass that on along to BC Transit and, and our other staff, because that's a good point. Okay, thank you. Dr. Marsh. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm wondering, Mr. Wakeham, if um, the district has looked at all at modal car share. I know it was recommended to us when we passed our climate action plan. And I note that there are fairly, um, there's, there's many vehicles in, in Victoria and Nanaimo, and we're kind of in the middle of that. Uh, are you familiar with MOTO? It's a cooperative nonprofit. I'm, I'm aware of the concept. Um, I'm not aware of BC Transit doing any uh, uh, looking into that, but I will, you know, I'll, I'll um, double check with them on that and see where they might sit because it kind of fills in with the, when we look at a potential taxi, uh, maybe that's an alternative they can look at it. Yeah, state. it's like $4 an hour for a member. Right. So yeah. that's a lot cheaper than a taxi. So I'm going to make a note that we should add that as a, as a comment as we're putting, as we're, excuse me, as we're putting together sort of suggestions on the next five to seven years of what we should be looking at. I think um, moto share and or taxis, we can kind of lump together in the same in the same grouping. Yeah, at the time they thought that it would only be suitable for Shemanus and Duncan, but I'm thinking Shawnee and Mill Bay and, you know, who knows? Cause it's been eight years and population has grown in this uh, South CBRD. So okay. thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Alternate Director Harrison. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chairman. The uh, concern that I have is that the percentage on that survey from the south end was about three percent, which would indicate that not a lot of the people, not a growth, a lot of growth has occurred with respect to using the uh, the transit system. And it's good to hear uh, Mr. Wakeham say that they're going to look at other ways of increasing it. But people do not like to take an hour to an hour and ten minutes to go from Mill Bay or Shawnigan into into Duncan, so they hence they're, they're probably not using it. But the other thing that I would ask um, Mr. Wakeham to take a look at is that maybe in the south end in particular, there has to be a sub transit system. I don't know how you'd, you'd phrase it that would connect Mill Bay, Shawnigan, and Cobble Hill because the core for the majority of the people who live in the south end for shopping, for doctors, dentists, etc., are either at Valley View. Mill Bay Mall, Shawnigan Lake. So to me, it would make sense that there'd be something that would be more dependable where you could actually go from Shawnigan and shop at Thrifties or a country grocer without having to wait an hour and a half or two hours to get back because you just won't use it. As Director Morrison has said, you'll take your own vehicle. So possibly we should be taking a look at that sort of thing. And then the other thing that I have a little bit of concern about, and I'll lay, lay it out here, that the location of the new hospital is going to pose, I think, problems for the people in the south end with respect to taking buses and going in there. Like coming out of Duncan the other day, the traffic was backed up past the farmer's market out there. There is no way in God's green earth that any vehicle was going to get in there in a hurry or get through there. So people out here are tending to look more to Victoria General, which is two traffic lights away as opposed to 22 to the to the new hospital and I think that has to be taken into consideration when you're looking at how we would revise the transit system that would serve you know a fairly large population out here in the south end that continues to grow so just throw that out there thank you uh, any other questions or comments 
All right, let's move on. We have R4, which is a decision item about fare free transit for children. Mr. Wakeham. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, this, this report uh, really introduces the recent uh, finalized provincial free fare um, transit program for children 12 and under. And, and with the adopted program, we're seeking approval to amend the 2021. Uh, annual operating agreement that goes till March 31 of 2021. Um, there, there is no, just an FYI, there is no budget amendment requirement for the CVRD 2021 year because theoretically this is supposed to be a wash. It's supposed to be a reclassification of revenues where the <clears throat> potential 12 and under uh, revenue would go down and the funding or grant from the province would go up. So um, it, this is a bit of a, a, it's not a pilot, but it is phase one because phase two, which will kick in um, next year's annual operating agreement, which starts April of 2022, we're expected that this program is supposed to have some form of registration for these children 12 and under. So we're still not sure what that's going to mean, but as far as we're told by BC Transit, the funding is at this point um, consistent and is supposed to be uh, uh, in, adjusted by CPI to some degree. So there is a recommendation put forth, and it's, uh, you know, I think this is pretty straightforward that it be recommended to the board that the amendment to the 2021 2022 CVRD BC Transit Annual Operating Agreement to eliminate the transit fares for children ages 12 and under and to include the provincial contribution to compensate for reduced revenue resulting from the program be approved. Do I have a mover and a seconder? I have a mover and seconder. Any questions, comments? Ms. Director Martin. Is, I noticed in the um, document that there's a requirement that it's one adult for four children. Um, is that a requirement? by the program or is it something specific? Uh, Director, you've hit the question that I've thrown back to BC Transit right on the head. And this is something that the province and BC Transit still have to look into. The current situation of four and under which we have has the responsibility of one paying adult. This new provincial uh, program does not. And so there's still some discussion going on as to who's gonna be responsible if two very young children go to get on the bus. Um, and so I don't have an answer for you other than I know this this was rolled out very quickly and BC Transit is looking into options and with the operating company okay. um, to figure out how that's gonna be, how that's gonna play out. So I, I can't really give you an answer for that. But right now, as far as I'm led to believe there, with the new program, there is not an adult required to, to attend with the, with the children 12 and under. Okay. Any more questions? Director Marsh. Yeah, as a mom of four very grown children, I don't think I can support this till we know what BC Hydro, um, like, I just don't like the idea of two seven-year-olds getting on a bus and and I, I understand it's not available on the commuter service before. Is it gonna be available on the commuter service now? Commuter service now? So it is, it is available, the, the, it is available on the commuter service right now where a child age four and under, they, they do get free. What's changing now is now they're moving up the age, up to age 12 and under, that's the difference. Um, and so right. um, the province is providing what they deem to be reasonable funding and, and hopefully consistent with what we would potentially be getting from our regular ridership. So that's kind of a wash and not the issue. Okay. Your point's well taken. I can tell you, I asked BC Transit this morning, is there any regions to date that have not supported this or debated the compensation? The answer is no, they've all agreed. They, all the ones that have been have responded so far, because there is a deadline, we have to get this responded back by September 1, because there needs to be some education and some marketing material needs to be done. Um, I think your point's well taken. And I don't think, my recommendation would be to, to um, accept the recommendation put forth and we will work with BC Transit and the operating company to not have that happen. I, I believe right now, if there's an issue on a, on a, with two young people getting on the bus, BC Transit's operator, the, the driver will call for a supervisor. This has not happened yet where there's been, you know, young people get on like whatever that age is, five, six, seven, eight, nine. But I believe they're going to work this out because this is going across the province. This is not just in our area. And it's the same request yeah. of all areas. So if I might, Madam Chair, I, I'd like to move an amendment to 
tell BC Hydro that we approve of this in principle and trust Mr. Wakeham to share our concerns. And, and some of my concerns are the very high rate of human trafficking, um, even including on the island of young, mainly females as young as nine years old. So I just think that I just like to know more before I feel comfortable um, endorsing it, except in principle. And I see you have something to say, Mr. Wakeham. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, just just a response back. You know, valid concern. Um, two things to keep in mind. You know, there is to some degree diligence on the part of the parents to supervise their, their children. And take note of what could happen now. If a child aged currently right now, age six, had 225, they would get on the bus because the current system is children four and under are free. So if a, if a child right now, if a parent gave a child the fare, $2.225, and they were eight years old, that would be that's that's the system you have in place now and i I'm, i haven't heard of any concerns um we don't really have the uh operator i don't think the operator's participating on this call um but i you know maybe i could just ask myrna who i think is listening if she has any other comments she could text me and i could respond to the committee but that there's not a, there's not a whole lot of a change from what currently is the situation right now the only difference is you're actually raising the bar from four age four to age 12. I see what you're saying, but I, I do not believe four-year-olds would be likely to decide to get on the bus and go to Victoria, whereas a 10-year-old might be likely to do that, and they may not tell their parent because kids will be kids, and, and I don't think most kids understand that potential risk of going to the city on their own. They might just think, oh, hey, let's just go, and we'll be back before dinner kind of thing. So that I... That's why I would prefer it to be amended to in principle if we can find out any parameters around that, like, um, I don't know, but, you know, they, you do make a good point, it's up to parents, but then, you know, kids also make decisions that parents would rather they didn't. So that's my hesitation. So, your, your point so Director, is Director Marsh has... Uh, moved a, an amendment to the resolution to add the words in principle subject to further information about the children's age and accompaniment by parents is that fair well i would i wouldn't want to um add accompaniment okay. by parents because i'm not sure that that's what this report is saying okay. But I would want to have more comfort that, uh, safe, subject to this, you know, assurance as much as can be possible of the safety of people, basically, of children. Okay. Do so I have a seconder for that am amendment? I'm not seeing a seconder. Madam Chair, can I make a comment here? I, I see that Myrna Moore is responding and texting me as we're speaking. What she's saying is, BC Transit is aware of the, this is a valid concern because this came down so quickly. And so they are working on operational policies as we speak, because there is, there is some uncertainty. And so, you know, if you wanted to make an amendment, I guess you could, to some degree, you could maybe suggest that uh, subject to BC Transit working out operational policies. Um, I, I'm, I'm nervous to use the word that would safeguard because those don't exist now, right? Um, but if you want to say subject to them just working out operational policies uh, with regard to giving direction to the operators, which is the drivers, I, I suppose that would be fair. Um, I would I would think that's a friendly amendment if we can have a seconder. Do I have a seconder? I don't have a seconder. So I'm going to, uh, any more comments or questions, uh, Director McGonagall? Thank you, Madam Chair. Would, would it be better to direct staff to uh, approach BC Transit with the concerns that were raised on uh, policy amendments regarding uh, underage instead of trying to do an amendment on the fly here? If we direct staff to investigate the uh, policy changes necessary to ensure uh, underage safety on transit system, that may be appropriate, Madam Chair. Thank you. I think we've got a bit of a time issue here, so we need to uh, move on this one way or the other. Director Seaburn. 
Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And that was my concern. I, I totally understand what Director Marsh is trying to get at. The reason, I don't know anybody else, but the reason I didn't second the motion is I, I'm not clear what adopting this in principle does. We either sign the agreement or we don't. And and that's that's the fundamental issue. And, and I've been trying to uh, interject myself into this discussion to ask Mr. Wakeham that question, because uh, I, I don't think the answer is the the notion of, of doing this in principle, because like I said, that doesn't get you anywhere in terms of signing the agreement. Uh, I think the I think uh, Director McGonagall hit it on the head. You know, staff is aware of the concerns. And I think BC Transit's been made aware of the concerns. They're watching the meeting and they're texting Mr. Wakeham. So I think it's going to be dealt with. It's kind of a moot point. Let's move on. That's my position. Thank you. Director Morrison. Uh, much as uh, Director Sebring had stated, uh, Mr. Wakeham says he's already made the inquiry. Senior management at, at BC Transit are on the line. They're clear, clearly aware. This is operational stuff. Let's uh, let's vote on the resolution and move on. Thank you. I'll call the question. All in favor? Any opposed? Director Marsh is opposed. Okay, next item. We're back to Interregional Transit Service, Director uh, Mr. Wakeham. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. This is the last of my last of my reports, uh, and it is transit related. This is a verbal update, um, and it's kind of timing again because the uh, RDN's transit meeting is tomorrow. It's always the day after us. But um, so I just want to give you a little background here. I last gave an update on May the fourteenth uh, when we sent a memo and advising that the RDN Transit Committee. Um, that they approved uh, using their 2,500 expansion hours, which was targeted for March of 22 and 2, and 2,800 internal hours. So both those hours, 5,300, makes what we really required with our first go round of the CVRD RDN connector. But there was a condition uh, for that to work, and that's the BC Transit had to quickly see if they could acquire two new heavy duty buses to add to the one new RDN bus and um, uh, so the one RDN bus they had as well as a new one. So um, in, in relatively short time, BC Transit has done everything possible to see, can they acquire two buses? Can they get them from other regions? And you got to remember, this was originally planned for September of 2022. This got moved up to March of 2022. So unfortunately, I've got a little bit of bad news. The update is BC Transit has just advised us they're not able to get those two buses that are needed. And there's just not enough time to get new ones that are from other regions. However, the RDN uh, still has the 2,500 hours in the new bus. And the team of the RDN, BC Transit and us, we're now working on developing a plan on what service level could we um, introduce without potentially the two extra buses. It really comes down to the RDN feels they can handle putting in pretty much the service that we originally spoke of. Um, but it comes down to are they utilizing, are they cutting into utilizing some of their spare fleet? And there's a spare, spare fleet, pardon me, spare fleet ratio that BC Transit requires. And it's 20%. 20% of their fleet has to be sitting ready in case there's breakdowns or for maintenance or inspections or whatever. If you start using your spare um, buses to run scheduled trips and you run into a problem, then there's gaps in the service. So I know BC Transit is pretty strong in ensuring that 20% uh, spare ratio is maintained. Um, but we're still hoping uh, this service can still be close to what we proposed. And if you remember, the proposal was seven Monday to Friday trips and six on Saturday. I guess our team, when we heard the news, we felt it was still best to develop, at least I would say a phase one, maybe an introductory service. And I, I don't wanna throw a number out there, whether it's three or four trips, I don't really know, but we still feel it's, it's with all the work that both boards and we've done is we still want to move ahead with this. Our next project team meeting is is next week. It's on July the 20th when the RDN staff are going to present their level of service and how many trip times they think they can comply and still be with the BC Transit ratio fleet. So I just wanted to give you an update. Um, there's nothing you need to do at this point. We will, the next really um, item we'll need your approval on will be in September because in September, we will be bringing forth the, the transit expansion uh, annual allotment of our uh, desired requests. And the first item is the RDN because it, it actually falls into this year, the last month, um, this year of the provincial year. But 
So it's just an update. Keep our fingers crossed that the RDN can um, work whatever magic they can to absorb possibly uh, uh, one or two buses within their fleet to make this system still run for us. I just thought it was appropriate for me to update you on this. Thank you. Any questions? No questions right now. So we have a decision to make. It's 4.05. We can take a break now or we can press the last issue and then do our 10 minute uh, question period break. Is that okay if we do that? Director Wilson? Yeah, sorry, Madam Chair. Just go back to say that again, please. Which way? <laughs> I would prefer to just carry on and then take our ten-minute break after that. Let's uh, get things so done. Would I. Yeah. yeah. So would I. Any anyone object to that? Okay, let's move on. Now we get to do recreation. R six. Ah, Mr. Elzinga, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good afternoon, directors. Uh, regarding regional recreation, uh, my first order of business is to provide an introduction. So also on the call today is uh, Mr. Jason Blood, representing uh, North Cowichan Parks and Recreation. So Jason is available if there's any North Cowichan specific questions. Chris Barfoot was invited as well. He was unable to attend today. And uh, as part of the terms of reference, the three jurisdictions are responsible for moving this initiative forward. Uh, regarding the terms of reference uh, and the public input that we received regarding this uh, this issue, uh, this is relevant to nine recreation facilities, uh, Cary Park, Shawnee Lake Community Center, the Couchin Community Center, Couchin Performing Arts Center, the Couchin Aquatic Center, Couchin Sportsplex, Fuller Lake Arena, Couchin Lake Sports Arena, and Frank Jameson Community Center. So those are the nine facilities that we're talking about that are relevant to this report today. Uh, as promised, we would be bringing forward this uh, report for information around a facility use analysis. There was some question whether it would be valid, and we've pulled the recreation uh, managers around the region and felt that we could do a facility use analysis through November and March and make this valid. So this report is for information, Madam Chair. I'm happy to take any questions. Director Wilson. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one of the things that uh, has come up, uh, and this is part of the public input that I asked for the other directors to see there, um, and I have spoken with um, Director Yanni Donado uh, about this particular uh, subject, and that is to the, the Cow Bay boat launch, which is not included in these nine facilities there, but it is a regional recreation thing. We are seeing more and more people using parks and boat launches, etc. Um, I would like, if possible, to see the Couch and Boat Lord included in this survey of usage, uh, mainly from the point of view of, as you can see there, there are more and more people using that, and it's sometimes not used for the purpose it was meant to be there. And there will be some problems there uh, as we go on into the summer. Um, I'm just wondering um, whether I can make a proposal or whether I could ask uh, Mr. Elzinger if we can include that uh, that boat launch in the um, in the usage and recreation survey when it's carried out. Mr. Elzinger, would you like to comment? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and through to Director Wilson. I certainly appreciate the comment, um, and there has been discussion over the past five years about the cutoff for the terms of reference, what facilities should be included and what, faci or what facilities should not. Um, it's a continuation of the work that's been done for the past five years with the terms of reference, with the facilities that have been identified. In my opinion, it would be really difficult to change that terms of reference now and include a facility or even delete a facility. Thank you. Um, yeah, facility, uh, follow up, please, Madam Chair. Certainly. Yeah, I, I understand that the um, the terms of reference are, are, are obviously what you go by, um, but things have changed in the last five years. Uh, we're, we're getting things which five years ago weren't really a part of that. There have been a lot of improvements made to that place. And certainly uh, it, it needs to be changed. Is there any other way that we can somehow do some kind of study which says, look, we're using this more and more. What are we going to do about it? Uh, there are concerns uh, about parking and everything else that goes on down in Cayo Bay, which is just as bad. Thank you. Director Morrison. 
Thank you. Uh, just in in regards to the uh, the previous speaker, and and you know, there's this is as Mr. Elzinga had uh, had laid out. This has been a, a long standing project, I guess you would say, Mr. Elzinga, that uh, um, been very well discussed from from uh, start to finish, and and I think that uh, uh, Director Wilson's desire to have that. Uh, that studied is 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 fair enough. Uh, more likely to, uh, you know, I would I would think fall under a uh, a parks initiative as opposed to uh, a recreation facility. Uh, it was it was very clear when we started that uh, that the the f facilities that were included were uh, were of that major sort of recreational uh, built structure, not uh, not a park facility as. Uh, as the Cow Bay boat launch is, and, and I think that if uh, this were brought forward at, uh, with uh, park staff, uh, that uh, there would be support amongst the uh, directors to, to look at doing something, uh, but definitely external to this process. Uh, my question to uh, Mr. Elzinga, um, you know, we yes, we we want good numbers, and and uh, the, you know, this is this is part of the process. We've we've got something to move forward at. Uh, at uh, the next uh, general election to to bring to the community, but I I'm just concerned that uh, coming out of COVID as we are, um, is this going to be a facility use uh, study that will have an asterisk by it that that you know is going to be an effective tool for us to use in in adjusting numbers. So, Madam Chair, through to Director Morrison. Um, in staff's opinion, it will be a valid study. Uh, so as you know, nobody can predict the future uh, with uh, the situation around COVID-19. Uh, we're in phase three of the BC restart uh, at this point. Uh, we are expanding our recreation provision of services up to 100%. Um, so there is a transition period that we uh, anticipate being complete by October. And so staff's recommendation is that we move forward uh, with this, with a valid study. Director Smith. Uh, thank you. I um, would just like to bring forward that I heard uh, Mr. Elzinga state that it's too late to bring forward uh, inclusion or exclusion of any of the facilities. Um, the Salt Air Community Centre was basically purchased in 2014 by the CVRD board uh, and the Salt Air taxpayers have been funding it. This is an 18,600 square foot building that is uh, double the size of the Shawnigan Lake Community Centre and the users um, since it's basically worked through and become set up as of 2017. So it wouldn't have been an opportunity for it to be included in this significant uh, recreation um, terms of reference, but it is heavily used by the community of Shemanus. Uh, very few people in Solterra use it and a lot of uh, Ladysmith. So um, when you start looking at figures and things like that, uh, maybe we should also look at uh, looking at whether we should start including some of these other facilities that are within um, our taxpayers' base and making sure that the funding is actually funded by the users from the different areas. And so I'm not sure um, how I would go about making a recommendation that we include the Salt Air Community Centre in um, the significant, I mean, Shemanus doesn't have a community centre, so it it moves um, some of the, the load into Salt Air. So maybe Mr. Elzinga can speak to that. I know it's under the Salt Air Community Center is under the CVRD Parks and Trails. So I know it's a little bit awkward for Mr. Elzinga to bring this into the conversation. Thank you. Mr. Elzinga. 
so, Madam Chair, there's a couple of points there. So, um, at this point through the process to try and bring this to a public approval process in October of next year, we've been on this trajectory through a number of different steps. And uh, so we're quite a ways along. It, uh, I stand by it would be difficult to add or delete facilities at this point. However, it is worth raising that at any time in the future, if there are significant facilities added, I think the question was raised that if there was another aquatic facility uh, built in the region within the next 10 years, what would happen? Uh, the answer to that is that the uh, jurisdictions that are proximate to it would most likely fund the construction and long-term debt servicing of a large new facility. And the board would have to make a separate decision whether to include the new facility into the operational formula for, uh, but that's that has always been intended to be a future discussion for any new facilities in the region. So I'm not sure of its relevance to this particular discussion. Thank you. Well, I, th I don't think it is relevant and it clarifies that for me. Director Marsh. Yeah, I was yeah. just going to say that there's, I don't know, maybe Mr. Elizinga, you can tell me how many years since we had, I can't even remember his name, the the master of, of doing this work. How, how long has the CVRD been working on this af after we set the terms of reference? Six years, five years? Madam Chair, uh, for this time, uh, yes. this time the board directed staff as of October 2015, the terms of reference was adopted by the board in January of 2016, but uh, Brian Johnston of Professional Environmental Re Recreation Consultants has been working with us for over 30 years and was uh, the architect of the recreation master plan of 1985. Yeah, I, I thought, I just couldn't remember all those facts. You know, I think it's important to, uh, Shemanus actually does have a community center. Um, we don't have a lot of rooms for the public, but there are several and they can be broken down and there's yoga classes and whatever you call that biking fasting class. And there's um, Qigong and uh, it's at Fuller Lake Arena. Um, you know, I think, you know, we're not looking at the hub, which I would argue has a lot more services offered. We're, you know, the, this was chosen by a professional and uh, these are supposed to be major facilities as Mr. Um, Alzinga has, has said. And, you know, to bring in College and Bay boat launch, well, then you'd need to bring in Shemanus boat launch and Crofton boat launch and Shawnigan Lake boat, boat launch. And it, I just think that if that is something that, that we want to do regionally, that would be separate than the major recreational buildings where programs happen, which was this what this was meant to do. And it was meant to do it on a on a basis that was more fair towards usage. And I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I do recall because I do have a lot of empathy for Director Yanni DiNardo. Um, it, her taxpayers will be paying less money when this passes because she has been a, a trooper and, and participated in many recreational facilities. And so it's just gonna make everyone pay almost a more equal amount if, if, if unless something's changed significantly from the time we had with a consultant. And so, I, that's that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Let's hear from Director Yanni DiNardo. Thank the you so much. I I just wanted to speak to um, um, the South Couch and boat launch as well, which um, would be something that um, Director Wilson and I could speak to um, Parks and Recreation over the last year and a half. So I think. I think that's why the community, um, we received this letter from Mr. Pelche saying that, um, you know, the issues that we've already known have been heightened and also recreation vehicles are all parking there. Uh, we do not have an RV campsite at all in Couch and Bay or even around. So that is another issue. So that is something that um, probably we could address. And it is very much a regional service that is provided there too. So we can look at that through our parks department. Thank you. 
Thank you, Director Wilson. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Director Yana Donato has actually um, said exactly what I was going to say. Uh, she and I will work together with Parks and uh, we'll bring something forward later on so that we can include this. Thank you. So I have Director Martman and Director Smith. Thank you, Chair. And, and through the staff, um, thank you. I, I had a I think I've read most of this report um, fairly thoroughly, and I think if I understand correctly, so this is my question. You see using this 2017 data to go along with data that you collect at the end of this year in early 2022 to advise a question that will come up in October 2022. Have I got that right? So if that's right, I guess I would probably want to understand how 2017 data is going to be considered to be reliable five years later. Um, and it may influence the data of 2022, partly because change of habits, change of demo, uh, demographics, um, change. I just see this not being a, I guess, how do you see that adding to the the, the data that will help decision makers on the referendum versus diluting what the information accurately is in that comes out in 2022. Mr. Olsinga. Uh, so Madam Chair, I, I think there was a number of different points in there. So hopefully I'll, I'll capture all of those. But uh, regarding uh, the validity of 2017 data today and uh, validity of uh, 2022 data, um, so you're, we're using a usage-based model which required consultants to uh, gather the data through three different forms, drop-in usage, program registration and user group uh, um, user group membership lists. Um, so that's not a perfect science. Uh, the consultants at the time who uh, we are, we certainly respect in the field identified that that is correct 19 times out of 20 plus or minus 5% as a scientific uh, uh, set of data. And so having the data taken more often makes it more reliable. So that's one point. The, the second point is that uh, you wouldn't want to see peaks and valleys over, over time. And so if you take it every so often, it would be a gradual shift in demographics. Um, the intent, Director Martin, is to do this, and I believe it's board approved at this point, to do this every five years and have three sets of data that would be a rolling average. For uh, your information, the uh, Nanaimo has done this and done user-based data every five years, included in a rolling average. And they've done it for quite some time now. And I believe they're discontinuing it because they find the data is similar and not worth the expense of collecting over time. So our uh, staff's recommendation is still to do it, still to do a rolling average based on our understanding from our consultants in the field. And a follow-up, if I may? Yes. Yeah, so which leads me to, you know, importance of data and accuracy and, you know, the plus or minus 5% or 3%, I think it says in the report, um, and how it relates to when you have such small percentages like Area H has and how it could skew it one way or the other, you know, underpay or overpay um, is, is a concern from for our area residents. But the other piece is that I'm not clear on what is the question that's going to be asked? Mr. Rosinga. So, so Madam Chair, staff have committed to come back to the board with the actual question, which has not been devised at this point, but it would be along the lines of once this average has been calculated, uh, the question would be to change the funding formula for the nine regionally significant facilities to a user-based model. And typically with a question like that, backup data is supplied but typically a referendum question is fairly simplistic. I'm not sure if Ms. Legault wants to assist me with this, but uh, we wouldn't be saying all of the numerical changes that would be provided as backup data through a fairly extensive public engagement and frequently asked questions process at this point proposed for June through October of next year. But a fairly simplistic 
referendum question would be to change the current funding formula to a user-based funding model. Thank you. Um, Ms. Ms. Legault, CVRD information technology is on the screen and it's very distracting. Is there something going on? Uh, the information technology is uh, has no video. About what type of foundation is is accepted. There's something going on with my mind too. I keep getting these screen changes moving moving around, and I don't know why. So I just keep turning it on and off. Okay, it's you then. Sorry, I, I thought it was the information technology one. All right. A quick follow up, if I may, Chair. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. And uh, and I guess the other detail to the referendum is: is it an option? Is it an opportunity for areas, individual areas, to opt in or opt out? Uh, I think I can answer that. I don't believe it is at this point. <laughs> so, well, there, it, it, yeah, correct just, me if I'm wrong. Yeah, Madam Chair, through to Director Martman, in staff's opinion, that is not an option, and if. Uh, the board changed, the committee and the board changed its direction to an area by area referendum. Staff would recommend stopping the process. All right. Um, Director, Director Martman, I don't know if you've read some of the reports that have uh, um, been done on this. It's gone back a number of years and it is really, if you're interested in this, it is very worth reading all the details. Um, yeah, that's what I would recommend. Director Sebring. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I I would echo what you just said. I mean, this thing has so much history, and it's it's tough to wrap your head around it. I've I've been at this table for a dozen years or more. And, uh, I'm trying to remember some of the early stuff. There was the, the I don't know different colors, the pink and the orange and the blue model. There was all kinds of different proposals that were put forward. I'm just excited that we're getting it to this point. I appreciate the update from staff. This is not a report for decision it's a report for information and i appreciate the, the the work that they've done and i would encourage mr elzinga and, and uh, the rest of staff to stay the course and keep going on this because it's to me it's one of the more significant and important um pieces for us as a region to, to actually start viewing some of these issues regionally um you know there's there's some there's some discussion that says North Carolina is the biggest beneficiary. I'm not sure of that. Uh, I do know that that you know there's there's an elephant in the room, and that is the aquatic center. I mean, when we first built it, and we couldn't find a way to to regionally uh, fund it. Uh, as most of you know, there was a two tier admission system, which was a nightmare for our staff to administer. We reached agreements with a few of the electoral areas in the immediate proximity and, and they've been paying into it those agreements have now expired and uh you know at some point we have to look at that again as north couch and also the city of duncan uh because it's a potentially a money losing proposition for us and and you know i'm not in any way threatening that we go back to two tier but you know what that's that's where we came from and and it may have to go back to that i, I really hope not and i'm hoping that this process can avoid that eventuality. And I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Um, I have Director Smith and Director McGonagall. Director Smith. Uh, I don't believe Director McGonagall has spoken. I would let him go first. Mm. Director McGonagall. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Director Smith. That was not necessary, but I appreciate that. I just wanted to remind uh, everyone of the timeline of regional recreation as uh, Director Sebring had stated. Uh, um, it has been a long, arduous process. And when, when we decided to move forward with a referendum question, I know there were a few of us that were excited. But from the onset of the timeline, it's always been the nine identified regionally significant facilities that have been included in in, in the discussion to, to suggest that perhaps we look at other options would skew the data from 2017 
on moving forward with that uh, referendum question. And as 2017 is the baseline numbers, I think the numbers from 2022, once we do get to stage four, may give us an idea of what the demographic and the usage has become in the, in the recent five years. It is important to A, have a baseline to work on and to incorporate updated numbers as we move forward. But taking into account uh, some of the suggestions from um, Mr. Elsinga that on an ongoing basis, that may not be necessary. To, to think that we need it every two or three years, I, I think is, is redundant. But as the baseline model and the nine facilities, that has been the discussion from the start. Thank you, Director Smith. Thank you. I appreciate uh, the thoughts and the conversation that's gone around the table. I still feel that the Saltair Community Centre was not um, available to be considered within the terms of reference at the time that this was started. And I am going to make a recommendation uh, to the board that the Saltair Community Centre be added to the regional recreation facilities. And I would like support from the directors to move that forward. Do I have a seconder for that motion? I have a seconder. Anyone like to comment, discuss? Director Smith. I feel that this is an important uh, opportunity for us to look at an 18,600 square foot building that has recreation potential, uh, not only for um, Saltaire, but for Ladysmith, Shimanus, and North Cowichan, other areas also. And I think that if we don't look at a building that has this potential, then we're closing our minds as we move forward and saying only these are the most regionally significant. If you compared the data, the information regarding the terms of reference, you would find that the Saltaire Community Centre also fits into that. Uh, the terms of reference, and I'd like the committee to uh, directors to support that. Thank you. I have Director McGonigal and then Director Martin. Unfortunately, uh, as I stated earlier, with the identification of the nine facilities historically and moving forward with the baseline, I cannot support the inclusion of the Saltair Community Centre. Thank you, Director Martin. Uh, I would have a question through to staff on on trying to make a decision on this for me uh, or for myself. Um, and the question is about would there not be in the best uh, world a process that we could follow that would allow, you know, either take it on or take it off the list? And what would you look at that being? Mr. Elzinga, would you care to comment? I'm going to ask uh, Director Martman to uh, say that again. I'm, I'm not sure I picked up the whole gist of the question. Director Martman. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I guess what I'm asking is, uh, to me, this is a process question, and um, that or a motion that's being forward is like, I'd like to add this in. And wouldn't there be, a pro or couldn't staff come up with a process that would say, this is the timing, this is how we should be doing it in a, in a you know, in a very straightforward manner, or actually taking things off the day off the um, list as well. So just curious if that's a, a way to do this. Mr. Elzinga. So Madam Chair, through to Director Martman, um, I guess my best answer is that staff does have to come up with a process uh, for adjusting the nine regionally significant facilities in the future once it's approved by the public. That's that's how I would interpret that. Is there's a number of to-do items like that. So scenarios, what would happen if? And so, as I said uh, earlier, uh, one of those scenarios would be if a new facility was approved in the region, how would we address 
uh, bringing it into the into the formula, it would be staff bringing that to the board's attention and uh, the board would approve the operational expenses, not the capital, not the debt servicing, but the operational expenditures of that new facility. Why it's difficult at this point is we're kind of mid process. We have, we're intending to bring this forward to the public in October of 2022. So um, it would be challenging to do any changes prior to that date, in Mr. my opinion. Mr. Carruthers would like to weigh in. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think it's important to note, and <clears throat> Mr. Elzinga just mentioned it, the purpose of this um, uh, referendum and this new proposed service is to cover the operating costs. Uh, the CBRD does not operate the Saltair Community Centre. We we own the building, but we, we've turned it over as a lease to the Saltair um, uh, Society that operates that. The, we do not operate that facility as we do the other nine significant facilities where we have staffing and operating costs and so that is a significant difference we would be comparing apples to bananas uh if we tried to include the salt air community center in uh in this and it's recognized that the cbrd does own it but again as as john said that's not the intent uh, of this service to cover the construction of a, of a facility the local jurisdiction would be responsible for that it is simply to cover the operations thank you so we have a motion on the floor. Uh, uh, Director Morrison. Sorry, Madam Chair. Um, I was just going to uh, slightly disagree with Mr. Elzing. I don't disagree with them very often, but I don't think we're midpoint in this process. I think we're sort of 11th hour and 58th minute, and uh, <laughs> changes would be just a huge issue to have to deal with. I would ask that the chair consider calling the question. Right. Well, I was going to try and do that. So we are going to hear from Director Toporowski next. Could you read the motion again, please? Yeah, I would like to uh, get that read. Ms. Lugo, do you have it written down? Uh, as I've noted, it is that the salt uh, that it be recommended to the board that the Saltaire Community Centre be added to the list of regionally significant recreation facilities. Is everyone clear? I'll call the question. All those in favour? And opposed? So by my count, everyone is opposed except for Director Wilson and Director Smith. All right, so we can take a 10 minute break. It's 4.37, so 4.47. See you back here, thank you. videos live. Thank you. Welcome back. Um, Ms. Lego, do we have any questions for question period? We do not. Then we need a motion to move into closed session. Uh, it's in accordance with Community Charter Part 4, Division 3, Section 90, Subsection 1A. Could I have a motion for the uh, motion moved and seconded? All in favor? All right, so we're gonna switch off the video 